Uh, the first speaker for this half of this morning is Claudia Golden. She's Henry Lee Professor of Economics at Harvard University, Director of the Development of the American Economy Program, and Research Associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Professor Golden is a member of the Advisory Board of the Congressional Budget Office. She previously served on the faculties of the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the University of Pennsylvania. <clears throat> she received her bachelor's degree from Cornell University and her master's and PhD from the University of Chicago. Professor Golden has made fundamental contributions to our understanding of labor market discrimination, gender roles in employment, the roles of education and health as major components of human capital, and the role of human capital in economic growth. I first came across Golden's research while working on problems of women in science. Her 2001 study with Rouse, which showed, that the val showed the value of blind auditions in overcoming sex-biased hiring by major symphony orchestras, opened my eyes to ways both to determine sources of bias and to um, correct for them. Golden, who can often be seen with a golden retriever in tow, has an uncanny ability to search out the real sources of bias and inequities, digging beneath the surface into the data to cause find causes and possible cures. Professor Golden served as president of the American Economic Association in 2013-14. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the Society of Labor Economists, the Econometric Society, and many other social science societies. Her awards include the IZA Prize in Labor Economics, the Mincer Prize of the Society of Labor e Economists, and the Carolyn Shaw Bell Award. Golden was elected to the American Philosophical Society in 2015. She will tell us about how to achieve gender equity in pay. Claudia. Thanks very much, Barbara. Uh, women earn less than men uh, per hour, and they earn less even when they work the same number of hours. So how can we achieve gender equality in pay? There are lots of answers. <laughs> but almost all of them won't move the needle very far. I have a solution, <laughs> but it isn't simple. So my talk concerns two issues. The first is how to achieve gender equality in pay, and the second is why are we obsessed about this now? The answer to the second question is sort of easy. It is that more young women are demanding career and family. Well, what is the relationship between the gender gap in pay and career and family? And the answer is that it's just about everything. Okay. I have a funny feeling that the, yeah, okay. Slides are slightly backwards, but that's okay, okay. So the gender gap in pay, and so what I have here is uh, a graph that the horizontal axis here is the age of a person and the vertical axis here is the, just treated as the ratio of female to male pay. And so what you can see is that there are various cohorts here. There's the youngest cohort, the latest cohort born in 1978, and the earliest cohort born in 1958. So what you can see is that for all of these cohorts, the gender gap in pay widens with age, largely because it widens with children, and we know that from other work. So achieving gender equality in pay is just about equivalent to eliminating the earnings penalty to being a mother. Okay, now to get back here. So many believe that gender equality in pay can be achieved through what I call various fixes. And some assert that we have to fix women. We fix them by making them better at bargaining, by making them better negotiators, by making them more competitive. And some claim that, no, that's not right. We have to fix the infants. We have to expand family leave, we have to subsidize daycare. And some say, no, 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 we have to fix the daddies by changing social norms, let's say, through paternity leave. 
And still others note, and in some sense the vast majority would, that we have to fix managers, those who hire and promote and cohort workers by making them less biased, either explicitly or implicitly. But these fix the policies address what I call the low-hanging fruit. And it's fine to pick the low-hanging fruit. It's cheap to do that, but it won't do much to advance women's ability to combine career and family unless something else changes. And that something else is what I call the costs of temporal flexibility. Unless they are reduced, you can fix all of these items and still not get anywhere near gender equality. Now, by temporal flexibility, I simply mean that it is an amenity that allows employees to work, let's say, fewer days per week, fewer hours per day, or work particular hours. In fact, most of what we mean by temporal flexibility is just that I'm gonna work at 11 at night, but not 11 in the morning because I have to take my child to the dentist or I have to take my mother to the doctor or something like that. But the point is <clears throat> that the cost to firms of the amenity is critical. If the amenity is expensive, so think about you go to work and it's a nice office and the chairs are nice and the rug is nice and the place is clean, that's an amenity. And it costs something. So if the amenity is expensive, then those who take the amenity, those who purchase it, will have lower earnings. Policies, in fact, that mandate flexibility may, in fact, be detrimental to women. Now, there's no simple solution here. But what I'm going to tell you is that the landscape is really not that bleak at all. Many firms and some occupations have succeeded in reducing the costs of temporal flexibility. And many of these are in the growth sectors of today, tech, science, health, and I'm gonna speak about these soon. Temporal flexibility is lessened when workers have good substitutes. When information technology has improved the ability of employees to be better puzzle pieces for each other. It's allowed them to pass information from one employee to another with little loss in fidelity. And it's allowed them to create effective teams of substitutes. Note that the cheaper is the amenity to produce, the more linear is pay by time worked. What do I mean by that? Quite simply, an individual who works 60 hours a week is simply getting double what two people would get if they were 30 hours a week. Rather than getting considerably more, that would be nonlinear or convex. Policies of various types have been tried to reduce the gender gap in earnings. And I have argued that reducing the cost of temporal flexibility is a better answer. So what's the evidence? First off, most of the gender gap in earnings is in within occupations rather than between occupations. In fact, only about 22% of the total gender gap in earnings across all full-time, full-year workers is due to differences between occupations. What this means is that you can take women and give them men's occupations, or you can take men and give them women's occupations, and you will have reduced the gender gap only by 22%. Most of the gender gap is due to what's happening within occupations. And by an occupation here, I mean the 500 occupations that the U.S. Census uses. So it's not a great big occupation, nor is it a very well-defined one. The second point is that the gender earnings gaps vary substantially by occupational group. By that, I'm referring to finance and business, health and tech, and so on. And third, these differences in relative pay, you can relate them to aspects of occupations that actually concern temporal flexibility. And I'm gonna demonstrate these last two points here. 
So my interest is primarily right now in the top 100 or so occupations by earnings since those are the ones for which careers are the most important. And first off, I'm going to graph these occupations by gender earnings gaps on these axes. And so the axes are on the vertical axis is just the ratio of female to male earnings. And on the horizontal axis, it's simply a count. And you'll see. And I create two groups. One is business and finance and law, plus all health occupations with high self-employment, such as podiatrists, chiropractors, and, and so on, as you can see here. And so all I've done here, each one of these dots, each one of these squares is an occupation. And some of them have very large gender gaps, that one down there at 0.65, and some lower, the one up there at 0.9. All I have done is I've ordered them. Very simple. The second thing is that I'm going to put now in the science and technology ones. So this is just science and technology plus health with low self-employment. And you can see them here. And so within each of these groups, the occupations are graphed ascending in the ratio of female to male annual adjusted earnings. And this is adjusted for a whole bunch of things that I'm not going to bore you with now. And no, the, as I said, the horizontal scale is simply a count, one, two, three, four. It's just counting from one to 80. It's just the occupations. I'm just ordering them. I'm going to have a nice uh, horizontal scale soon, but this is simply ordering them. Okay. So note that the calculation of these ratios is for full-time, full-year workers, 25 to 64 years old, and it holds many potentially confounding factors constant. Astoundingly, only six business and finance occupations of this group here have a gender earnings ratio that exceeds the lowest in the science and technology group. Mean differences are large, weighted by those in the occupations, business and finance has a ratio of about 0.79, and science and technology about 0.9. But why do these gender gaps vary? And the answer largely concerns their time demands. And I'm going to show that you this using what I need is for every single one of these occupations, I need to know a lot about the occupation. And I get this from the Department of Labor's Occupational Information Network called ONET, and I pick of the many different characteristics. Right now, I'm only looking at five, and that is the importance of contact with others. How important is, is it? Not at all, very much. Interpersonal relationships, time pressure, unpredictable hours, and a highly structured workplace. So what I do is I now I have a horizontal axis, and that horizontal axis I will describe right now. But the vertical axis is the same one I had before. It's just the gender gap. I normalize these five characteristics, and I sum them to form an aggregate measure. The higher the value means more time demands, less predictable hours, greater personal contact is required. And as you can see, these ONET characteristics have a very strong negative relationship with the gender earnings gap. In fact, a one standard deviation increase in these time demands lowers the ratio by almost six percentage points. What this means in terms of these two big groups of occupations, business and finance versus science and, and technology is that if this were a causal estimate, and I'm not saying it is, if we switched one to the other, we would in fact reduce the gender gap by about a half. So what then, you're asking yourselves, what then can alter these characteristics? And so let me answer this by way of an example. The occupation of pharmacist is the eighth highest paying occupation in terms of median earnings for men. And I know most of you are going to say, really? <laughs> it is. It's actually the third for women among full-time year-round workers. But women didn't always do that well as pharmacists. The ratio of female to male median annual earnings in pharmacy was about 0.66 in 1970. It's 0.92 in 2010. 
Why? Well, for one thing, pharmacists today who work more hours earn more in a linear fashion. There is virtually no part-time penalty in pharmacy. They are perfect puzzle pieces for each other. I doubt that any one of you has ever gone to a pharmacy, maybe one or two, and maybe some time ago, and said, I want to see a very particular pharmacist. How is that? Information is transferred from one pharmacist to the other with perfect fidelity. How did this come about? There are three somewhat unrelated reasons at the core of this egalitarian profession more standardized drugs, and an effective use of information technology increase the substitutability of pharmacists for each other. Increased corporate ownership, which you usually say bad is actually good here, it vastly reduced the fraction of pharmacists earning rents from being the residual claimant. Examples of other occupations that have successfully reduced the cost of substituting across employees by creating teams of independent professionals include anesthesiologists, obstetricians, pediatricians, some in the banking and the real estate sectors, discount stockbrokers, and the new medical specialty of hospitalists has reduced the cost of flexibility for all of our PCPs. Why do fixing organizations and jobs matter so much to gender equity rather than those low-hanging fruit? What if the fix the daddies policy actually succeeded in increasing daddy time with kids? That would actually increase the demand for this amenity of temporal flexibility and would actually increase its price. Women's earnings and consequence would actually decline relative to those of men who are not doing 50-50 at home. But if instead of a fix the daddy's policy or in tandem, better yet, the cost of, if the cost of producing the amenity decrease, the earnings of those who have greater preference for it will unambiguously increase. And since these individuals are disproportionately women, the gender wage gap would shrink. Now, I usually when I talk about this, I usually end and say, there will always be occupations for which the cost of temporal flexibility will be high. And I always give the example of the President of the United States. <laughs> and I usually say, I don't want my President thinking that she can have temporal flexibility. And there will always be occupations for which there are no effective puzzle pieces. So the question is how large that category is. It's always going to be there. How large? Finally, why are the issues of gender equality and pay being talked about so much now? Why are they of really greater importance? And the answer is quite simple. Career and family is far more important to women now. There are more female college graduates. For the current crop of 25-year-olds, by the time they're 35, 45% will have graduated from a four-year institution. There are more of those planning careers. Fully one quarter of women with BAs continue for one of the higher degrees, beyond a master's. And most importantly, and I think somewhat surprisingly, more of the career-oriented group is planning to have kids. Birth cohorts of college graduates from the mid-50s to the, this is birth cohort, from the mid-50s to the late 1950s, almost 30% of those women didn't have a first birth by the time they were 44 years old. Okay. That was really high. That was sort of the peak of college graduate women foregoing family to have career. Today, that has plummeted to 20%, just over 20%. So college women are having a lot more kids. So each of these components, increasing the demand for career and family, 
And the demand for equity in the workplace is at an all-time high. <clears throat> Achievement of career and family has improved for women across cohorts according to my estimates. But, and this is really important, even though many women with children eventually achieve career later in life, younger women today want career and family now, not later. So what can be done? Only by reducing the cost of temporal flexibility, only by changing work organizations, not by fixing the women, can gender gaps in earnings and occupations be substantially narrowed, and can the twin goals of family and career be achievable by a larger fraction of women and by men as well? Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. I, uh, I wanted to note to you that a recent study by one of um, our graduate students of online crowdsourcing shows that if you give people temporal flexibility, they do more work and they do it better. Yes, but it has to be cheaper. <laughs> uh, Rowena Matthews, University of Michigan. You didn't address the cost of fringe benefits in this temporal flexibility, and I wonder, that's a big driver in universities, about 30% of the total cost of employment. Uh, how do you reduce those costs? How do I reduce the costs of fringe benefits? No, I don't think that one wants to reduce the cost. You mean reduce the demand for fringe benefits? Who am I speaking? I'm not quite certain. Oh, hi, thanks. Yeah. There, uh, there, so that's an awfully big driver to this difference in it is a big cost of that's temporal right, but flexibility. You're, you're absolutely right, and that's going to bite for low hours people. Most of these people are not low hours. Most of these people are over 40 hours. So as I said before, temporal flexibility is not necessarily number of hours. It's when you take the hours. So when I do the same thing, so I have a separate talk in which I talk about um, hourly workers, and that's a different group. For hourly workers, you get very large part-time penalties, and some of that is coming about, some of that is coming about because of exactly the point you're raising. If you're working fewer hours and you're getting the same benefits, which is what has to be the case by law in the U.S., you're going to have lower hourly earnings. But for most of these workers, it's not number of hours, it's mainly when you take your hours. But that's, that's a very, very important point that we always have to keep in mind. Yeah. Hi, Julie Fairman from Philadelphia. You know, nursing is an interesting profession to look at. It's almost opposite of traditionally male professions. Nursing starting salaries, for example, at Penn, are the highest salaries of any college in the university. The problem is that it doesn't increase very fast. The second point is that in this female-dominated profession, women do not rise as fast into administrative positions than men do. So I'm wondering if these principles also apply to female-dominated professions. I think that they do apply to female-dominated professions. In terms of uh, nurses, one way to move up is to become a nurse practitioner, of course. And the other thing that I find fascinating, which is not where your question was going, but maybe you were thinking about this, is that we have sort of reinvented another profession and we have called them physician assistants, which has existed for some time, but it's been reinvented and it is more male. It's, it's still, it's about 50-50 now. And it's very, very highly paid, okay? But once again, many of these professions, and, and that of physician as well, is such that you come out with training and the vast majority of individuals stay in that profession. They get somewhat better at it. 
but it's not as if they're rising up in organization. Yeah. And so I think it's I think it's true even for some of the leading professions in the U.S. or elsewhere. Thanks very much. I'm totally okay. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you.